Good evening, or good, a good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the sixth annual Clinical Innovation Competition and the first in person after a long hiatus. We are going to start with a land acknowledgement. Good afternoon. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Uh, je me présente, uh, Leslie Fellows, uh, vice-doyenne uh, exécutive uh, d'affaires professorales uh, et professeur titulaire du département de neurologie et de neurochirurgie uh, dans la faculté de médecine et des sciences de la santé, uh, ici évidemment à McGill. Um, bienvenue à la sixième édition annuelle de la finale de la cérémonie de remise des prix du concours d'innovation clinique CLIC de McGill. I welcome everyone to the uh, 2023 Clinical Innovation Competition. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the afternoon. And thank you all uh, for joining this afternoon. Um, the land acknowledgement says it's been a site of, of diverse uh, exchange over millennia. And it's really, I think, going to be a wonderful example this afternoon of exactly the kind of diverse exchange that we need Un grand merci en particulier à M. Luc Sirois qui est avec nous cette soirée. Il est innovateur en chef du Québec, directeur général du Conseil de l'innovation du Québec et président fondateur du Conseil d'administration d'Axelis, la Société de valorisation de la recherche publique au Québec. Titulaire d'un baccalauréat en génie électrique de l'Université McGill, il sera toujours un membre de notre communauté. Merci d'être ici. I would also like to acknowledge and thank uh, Dr. Raymond Hakim, the creator of the Hakim Family Innovation Prize and the inspiration for CLIC. He's professor of clinical medicine at the Vanderbilt University Medical Center and a McGill Medicine alumnus, a champion of medical leadership and a leader many times himself. Thank you very much for being here, Dr. Hakim. And Dr. Rian Tawes, who's executive director and chief scientific officer of the Research Institute of the McGill University Health Center, also with us this afternoon. And of course, our past uh, CLIC uh, winners and applicants, uh, you're the, the engine that is driving this event, and it's great to see you here. Um, and I was sitting in my clinic this morning, and uh, at other times I'm wearing a researcher hat, and anytime you move between those two spaces, you are, I guess, struck by the challenges of connecting sometimes fundamental breakthroughs to, uh, to the people who need those breakthroughs uh, every day, who look at you across the desk and say, you know, come on. Uh, and I think that's exactly that kind of motivation that is driving um, this competition, how we can take uh, scientific breakthroughs of one kind or another and turn them into meaningful, impactful innovation that's going to, to improve the lives of patients. Um, so that's CLIC's aim, to promote innovative thinking in the faculty across McGill, across our affiliated uh, clinical centers to bring changes that will significantly improve patient care, whether that's you know, improving patient care, ideally making people feel better, but also efficiencies, improving the way we deliver care, um, empowering patients. Uh, so these are all goals that are going to obviously improve health in Quebec and elsewhere. The goal is to inspire individuals and teams to imagine new devices, diagnostics, platforms, programs, and maybe things we can't even name, they're so novel, uh, to improve health care in Quebec, Canada, and around the world. And most importantly, the faculty is committed to support and enable innovators so they can develop their ideas into actionable outcomes that will transform care. And I think this particular um, section, if you want, of the knowledge to action ecosystem, the space between fundamental research and application that's, that you can see and touch, um, is a really important space for us to fill. And I'm really pleased that the faculty and that this, uh, the CLIC competition is working on that because it's, uh, it's a really high impact, high potential to, uh, to, you know, to make real change that we can see, not in some hypothetical future, but uh, tomorrow or the day after. And just the exercise of trying to do that, I think, is really valuable for the whole research ecosystem, even if 
the application doesn't work. Uh, the exercise of trying to think through what's, in, what's involved is vital to inform the fundamental research. There's a reason they call it the knowledge to action cycle. Um, so whether the ideas work or not, they're for sure making a difference. So speaking of the, uh, of the support and the things that we can do together, I'd like to thank the extraordinary panel of judges uh, from ac 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 the academy, from industry, for sharing their expertise and their knowledge and their time. Uh, Nadine Afari, the head judge. Uh, Raymond Hakim, already mentioned. Uh, Denis Caceres, Jeremy Levitt, Michael Mee, Brent Norton, Gilbert Tordeman, and Corey Zankowski. Um, thank you. I'd also like to acknowledge the judges who were involved in the pre-judging phase, included uh, Stephen Arliss, Thomas Fevens, uh, Jerry Fried, Marie Hudson, and Dan Roden. And of course, the event and the prizes are made possible because of our amazing partners and prize sponsors. Uh, in that regard, we sincerely thank Dr. Raymond Hakim, this is Marika Zelenka Roy, and the Montreal General Hospital Foundation, uh, MI4, the McGill Interdisciplinary Initiative in Infection and Immunity, uh, Bereskin and Par LLP, Clinical Innovation Platform, District 3, the Dobson Center for Entrepreneurship, Osir Hoskin and Harcourt LLP, Avisio, Clio, and the Steinberg Center for Simulation and Interactive Learning, uh, all for their support of this initiative. Uh, it's a team that has put it together, made it possible, and we're going to hear from all kinds of good teams in a moment. So because of the people mentioned and many more, that Click continues to encourage uh, and build the next generation of innovators and problem solvers. Our faculty harbors great talent, and with the right resources and support systems, we can create healthier societies. I think that acknowledgement that it's not enough to have a good idea, you need the support to take it into action is what this uh, event is about. So on that note, I'd like to thank um, everyone for submitting a proposal for this year's competition. We had 35 high quality proposals, and I uh, extend my congratulations to the uh, five teams that have been selected as finalists. Um, and uh, winners. We are excited to hear your pitches and to celebrate your wins. I wish you all the best in your endeavors as you continue to identify solutions that will improve how we care for patients. There is certainly lots of work to be done. And I'll now present uh, to our next speaker, Dr. Gerald Fried, who is Associate Dean of Education Technology and Innovation and Director of the Steinberg Center for Simulation and Interactive Learning. Do I get to present to you? Everyone knows Dr. Fried. He hardly needs an uh, introduction, but he really is uh, uh, the epitome of clinical innovation, established minimally invasive surgery as a clinical and academic program at McGill in 1990. And I think some years later I got to learn from him as a medical student and still remember that. And he's become a trailblazer in simulation education for laparoscopic surgery and a leading innovator in surgical education. And of particular note, he's a 2021 recipient of the Duncan Graham Award for Outstanding Contribution to Medical Education from the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. And I'll stop talking and let him take the microphone. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Fellows, for your kind introduction. And we look forward to welcoming you very, very soon as our incoming Vice Principal for Health Affairs and Dean of the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences. And, you know, in the spirit of uh, peaceful transition, we're, we're willing to do a simulation of this event anytime you want, and uh, we welcome you to our Sim Center. It's truly wonderful to have all of you here for the sixth annual uh, celebration of innovation in healthcare at McGill and in person this year, as I said before. And as Dr. Fellow mentioned, our goal at the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences is to provide clinical innovators the tools they need to, succe to succeed. And anybody who takes care of patients is in a position to think of how they can do better. We should never be complacent. And we should always look uh, tomorrow to do better than we do today. We're really proud of the excellent resources and the partners that have been put in place to support as uh, aspiring entrepreneurs in early stage startups. And th particularly the leadership of Jake Barlett, uh, Director of Innovation at McGill. We worked together for quite a while now, and Jake has really spearheaded this, and I, I thank him for that. The Surgical Innovation Graduate Studies Program is a stellar example of this. It was one of Jake's, um, I think, great efforts. It's now in its 10th year, 
and it has uh, resulted in the development of several startup companies now. And the idea is based on a multidisciplinary team uh, consisting of clinicians, MBA students, and a team of engineers. And they, they go into the clinical environment, they identify unmet needs, and they work on creating solutions for these needs. This is just one of the examples of the many different approaches that we're doing at McGill to build the culture of innovation in our faculty. Over the next few hours, you'll, hear the you'll have the opportunity to meet members of our network and uh, mentors from industry, academia, and government. And we will have an opportunity to hear some wonderful ideas that have emanated from the McGill faculty and students. So to be eligible for the CLIC competition, there has to be a connection to the faculty uh, at, at McGill, either as a student or as a, a faculty member. We will begin by announcing three winning teams whose submissions were judged in advance by our CLIC judges to win the two MI4 Innovation Prizes and the Marika Zelenka Roy Simnovation Prize. These teams will have the opportunity to showcase their ideas during the ceremony tonight. Then you will hear from five finalist teams, as you heard out of a, a group of 35 excellent submissions, who will engage in a pitch competition vying for the prestigious Hakeem Family Innovation Prize and the Marika Zelenka Roy Innovation Prize. Each of those teams will have five minutes to pitch their innovative idea, followed by a five minute question and answer period with our judging panel. The winners will be announced after the cocktail break at the close of the competition. All of the CLIC teams who are presenting tonight will also be eligible for the Bearskin and, Pri and Par Innovation Prize, which is awarded to the team with the most competitive commercial value proposition and the winner of that prize will also be announced after cocktails. As the teams share their innovative concepts with you today, we would like to recognize the incredible amount of work that went into preparing these pitch presentations. Today's teams all had the opportunity for pitch training and coaching with Andrew Churchill from the McGill's Teaching and Learning Services, and you will soon see the wonderful impact of his coaching on the teams and their presentations. All the CLIC teams also were offered preparatory workshops on the fundamentals of business planning, intellectual property, and regulatory strategy to elevate the quality of their proposals. We want to thank the workshop facilitators, Edna Chasak from District 3, Clarice Baskins from Avisio, Denis Caceres and Carmela DeLuca from Bearskin and Parr. I also want to especially thank Diane Widener, who is here to my right, who put this event together with her unequaled organizational and communication skills and extraordinary grace. Thank you, Diane. We have also invited four startup accelerators to be part of today's event. The Dobbs, uh, McGill's Dobson uh, Center for Entrepreneurship, the Clinical Innovation Platform based at the Montreal General Hospital, Concordia's District 3, and Centec. They all have booths and exhibits in the main lounge, and I invite you to meet with their representatives to learn more about their services during the cocktail period. Now let's begin. It really gives me great pleasure to in introduce a distinguished McGill alumnus, Dr. Raymond Hakeem, who will share his inspiration for this competition with you. Dr. Hakeem began his career as a research engineer for Hydro-Quebec. We, we really needed you a few weeks ago, Dr. Hakeem. <laughs> he completed a Master of Science degree from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and a PhD in engineering from, the M from MIT. Not adequately uh, educated after all of that, he came to McGill and pursued a career in medicine and obtained his medical degree from McGill University. He did his residency in internal medicine at the Royal Vic, followed by a renal fellowship at Harvard and the Brigham and Women's Hospital. In 1995, Dr. Hakeem became one of the founders of Renal Care, a group which in, uh, in 2005 had the lowest mortality and morbidity rate among other dialysis providers. 
He attributes his success to a team effort, he's a very modest man, uh, in applying the principles of continuous quality improvements throughout the organization. Dr. Hakeem is currently an adjunct professor of medicine in the Division of Nephrology and Hypertension at Vanderbilt in Nashville. He's the recipient of numerous awards and recognition for his excellence in teaching and patient care. He's published extensively on clinical and basic science and chronic um, kidney disease, dialysis, and plasmapheresis. Dr. Hakeem, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It is with great pleasure and some pride that I stand here to celebrate and welcome you to the sixth anniversary of the McGill Clinical Innovation Competition and Award Ceremony. Je ne savais pas que vous allez être ici, mais je vous invite aussi à remercier votre présence ici. Merci. The idea to help McGill establish this competition and awards came to me several years ago while I was reviewing the background of some of the key innovators of the outstanding new business ventures in healthcare in the United States. Somewhat to my surprise, at, the at that time, several of the key executives and innovators in these American companies were Canadian, at least born in Canada, and many of them were McGill graduates. And a good example of that is when you, is shown when you read the brief CVs of the click competition judges, such as Nadine Afari, Stephen Arles, Brent Norton, Corey Zemkowski, and Dan Roden, and several others. Many of them have McGill background, Canadian background, and involvement in venture capital companies in the United States. And most of them have extensive experience in innovative solutions, and many have or had leadership positions in companies that made a positive impact in healthcare. And as I said, most of them have solid connection to McGill. So about seven years ago, I proposed this McGill-based clinical innovation project to Dean Eidelman and Mark Weinstein, and they enthusiastically supported it. And my family had the pleasure and honor of funding it in its early stages. And here we are celebrating the sixth anniversary of this proposal with more than 35 high quality applications received this year, from which five finalists have been chosen. And the concept and framework of clinical innovation competition is expanding in Quebec, as you well know. But not only do we have CLIC awards from the Hakim Family Fund, but also awards from the Marika Zelenska Roy Prize, funded from the Montreal General Hospital Foundation, and the MI4 Berenstein and Pear Prize. So most innovative proposals so more innovative proposals and more awards. What is also exciting is that the Canadian federal government announced in February of this year, February 2023, that they have funded the, quote, Canadian Innovation Corporation with a 2.6 billion, yes, with a B, billion funding over four years, with available funding per project from 50,000 to 5 million per project. So I hope this resonates with most of you and I hope the Click Prize winners will successfully apply and receive some of, their, some of that federal funding. Before I follow the directions, which was, I was given, be brief, be seated, <laughs> I wanted to take a few seconds to thank Manly Q and Diane Lynn Woidner and Jake Barolette for their hard work to arrange these meetings and make it so successful and impactful, particularly this year when the meeting is back in person and no longer virtual. I also want to thank the judges who have helped us pick the winners of this competition for their support 
and mentorship. I am one of the judges, and I have to say it is a tough job to pick five out of 35 outstanding applications this year, and later today pick the winner of the various awards. So thank you, judges, very much for all what you've done. Finally, I wanted to add my family's best wishes to Dr. Leslie Fellows in her new role as the upcoming Vice Principal of Health Affairs and Dean of the Faculty of Medicine. It is a tough job, but you're the best at it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Well, thank you, Dr. Akeem. Our next speaker, Dr. Ria Antoys, is the Executive Director and Chief Scientific Officer of the Research Institute of the McGill University Health Center. She also holds the Canada Research Chair in Cardiovascular Medicine and the Phil, Dr. Phil Gold Chair in Medicine at McGill University. Professor Toys is recognized internationally as an authority in vascular biology and hypertension. She's a prolific clinician scientist, a generous and inspiring mentor, and a collegial leader. Before being recruited to McGill and Montreal in September of 2021, Dr. Toys served for 10 years as the director of the Institute of Cardiovascular and Medical Sciences and the BHF Chair and Professor of Cardiovascular Medicine, the University of Glasgow in the UK. She received her PhD in South Africa and completed a postdoc at the Clinical Research Institute in Montreal in 1996. Dr. Toys is the Editor-in-Chief of Hypertension and the Associate Editor of Pharmacological Reviews. She contrib contributes to various publications and serves on scientific advisory boards and expert panels of numerous international institutions. She has trained over 100 uh, graduate students and fellows and has published over 600 peer-reviewed papers. Her research focuses on molecular and vascular biology of hypertension and target organ damage. And she has a particular interest in translational research where her discovery science impacts care of patients with hypertension and cardiovascular disease. Dr. Toys, it is an honor to welcome you today and ask you to share your perspectives on the intersection of research and innovation. Bonjour, bienvenue, and it is such an absolute pleasure to be here today at this very special event. Um, it's really quite um, daunting to be here with so much brilliance around, and I'm so excited to learn more about the innovations that you all have to share with us. I too want to thank the many people who've been involved in making this a reality, to the organizers, to the sponsors, to the funders, to Dr. Hakim and his family, and to the innovators who really thought about this amazing, um, this amazing initiative that has allowed us to be here after a number of years. Now we know that healthcare innovation is accelerating at an unprecedented rate. The advances like artificial intelligence, gene therapy, are really transforming the way diseases are diagnosed and treated. But the medical innovations that have occurred have not only occurred over the recent past. If we look back at history, the innovations related to the vaccines for smallpox in the 1800s, the innovations related to the development of antibiotics in the 1920s, and of course, the world's first organ transplants that occurred have truly revolutionized the way we treat and diagnose complex and less complex diseases. And none of this would have happened without the intersection between science, discovery, and clinical medicine. However, the 21st century has brought even more progress. 
And as we can see, things that were impossible to consider just a few years ago have now become possible. I was just speaking to Jake, and Jake said to me, I can have my designer shoes made right here in the clip with a very sophisticated 3D um, printer that he has. And so for those of you who want new shoes designed just the way you want, speak to Jake. We are already thinking of some entrepreneurial um, activities here. So all sorts of innovations that would have happened without that science, that discovery, and the practical implications. In the Research Institute of the McGill University Health Center, innovation is at the very core, it is the very DNA that drives our research, because without innovation, without discovery, we certainly wouldn't be able to do the fantastic things that we do do in terms of improved diagnostics and improved treatments. I also want to say how very proud I am to know that the CLIP and everything associated with the CLIP, the amazing work that Jerry has done and Jake and those who support um, the CLIP, um, we, we really, um, it's something that we are very proud about and I know that we have so much more to um, see that will be coming out of CLIP in the years to come. So with that, I too want to congratulate the um, amazing work that the applicants have put into the um, competition. As far as I can understand, I believe everybody is a winner here, and it will be especially exciting to see um, the results of the finalists and the winner later this afternoon. So with that, all the very best, and let's continue to see great innovations, discoveries that will impact um, our patients and our populations. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Dr. Toys. Um, it is uh, my, my pleasure, really, um, to now welcome uh, Luc Sirois, the Chief Innovation Officer of Quebec. Uh, in the Ministère de l'Economie et de l'Innovation. Um, his role in, in this job, as I understand it, is to engage enterprises and individuals to collaborate with the goal of innovating more and better, to become impactful change agents and to drive prosperity and development. Um, uh, Mr. Sirwa is a graduate of McGill, electrical engineering, I believe, um, also of University of Montreal, where he uh, studied communication and journalism, and then he went to Harvard to get his MBA. So I, I think you could start to hear a thing. These great achievers, Dr. Akeem, Mr. Sirwa, very interesting, uh, circuitous route, and it's the intersection, perhaps, of all these talents that have led them to be leaders and innovators. We welcome you, and we thank you, Mr. Sirwa, for coming to uh, join us today. Hey, the, it's so great to be here because you wouldn't suspect the, the connections we have here. Let me tell, let me share some of the stories. Alors, bonsoir tout le monde. Qui ici, who here is a participant and will actually, uh, did participate to some of those teams that will pitch tonight? Who's here are participants? You guys are right here. You guys are champions. Vous êtes des, vraiment des champions. Vous savez, moi, personnellement, when I was a McGill graduate, you know, in this same sheer dear building, this is when I had the occasion to meet Dr. The, Mr. Johnston back then, um, a, uh, notre recteur, and, and hear his fabulous legendary stories, and he would just tell us about his past, his visions for the future, and um, his studies at Harvard. Harvard. I said, well, well this is great. You, so act Canadians can actually go to Harvard. This is, well, this is uh, noteworthy here. This is noteworthy. So he planted the seed, and for me, it, did, it, it was transformational. It was transformational. Those conversations within these walls did bring me to Harvard. And the first thing that I kind of had to learn about, about the process was that, well, you know, you just need to shoot. 
You just need to apply. You just need to go and to try. And this is the amazing conclusion of, of tonight for you guys. It, you know, tonight you will pitch uh, a wonderful innovation. You will pitch a wonderful project. Uh, ideas you had, pro you'll do it in a fascinating way thanks to the workshops you followed and so on. And for myself, after, when I came back uh, from, from Harvard, I decided to say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back home. Uh, thanks to some of, of McGill grads who said, hey, why don't you bloom where you, where you were seated? Where, why don't you come back home and build businesses for the future, but from here in Montreal, from home? And, and this is when I played the role of the MBA and, and engineer in one of those startups, a spin-off from McGill 20 years ago that we created. And gee, are you lucky today to have so much support for innovation to be applauded and to be welcomed officially in, in the institution and to be supported and to have the financial resources and the support from the, from, from the leaders and to be welcomed so much like that. Because back in the days, whoa, it was not easy to do innovation projects like that. Dr. Falco and Dr. Bokorshak at the MUHC back then had a wonderful idea for radiation oncology. And being the engineer and BA, I was brought to the team, McGill grad as well, to create a business around that. So we did work on developing the, the innovation, on improving it, doing tests and so on and so forth. But to do so, we actually had to hide. Literally hide in the broom closet. Because Dr. Falco knew the actual schedule of the rounds of the guards. So he knew when to hide. He knew, <laughs> he knew at what time exactly would, the, would, would the, the, the guards pass in the corridor so we could actually go with the, closet, with the brooms and wait five minutes, see the steps of the guard pass by so we could keep, go, keep working. Today, no, no point in hiding. The point for you is to shine. The point for you is to be the champions tonight. Whether you will succeed in winning those wonderful prize or not, you are winners because you are moving forward. You are learning how to innovate. You are making this part of your culture. You are showing others that it should be done, that it can be done. You're learning the ways to iterate, to improve all the time. You're learning how to be innovators. Sometimes maybe we'll, you'll be entrepreneurs yourselves, but entrepreneurs or not, you will be change makers for the future of the nation. You should be all proud of you. Good luck tonight, everyone. Merci, Monsieur Sirois. Vous êtes une inspiration. Um, I would like to next introduce Dr. Marie Hudson. Um, we will move on to the uh, presentation of the first and second prizes for the MI4 Innovation uh, Competition. Uh, these awards recognize a preventative diagnostic or therapeutic innovative approach designed to address microbial threats to human health. Because these awards recognize specific categories, eligible proposals were reviewed by our judging panel in advance, and the winners chosen then. I would like to invite Dr. Marie Hudson, co-director uh, immunity of the McGill Interdisciplinary Initiative in Infection and Immunity, to hand out these awards. Dr. Hudson is a rheumatologist and epidemiologist at the Jewish General Hospital and Lady Davis Institute and associate professor and member of the Division of Experimental Medicine in the Department of Medicine at McGill University. She pursues res research in systemic autoimmune rheumatic diseases, in particular systemic sclerosis and autoimmune myositis. Dr. Hudson, thank you be for being here today to represent MI4. The floor is yours.
Thank you very much. Merci. Bonsoir. Um, alors, euh, je suis très heureuse de représenter euh, MI4 ce soir. On m'a demandé de parler, de dire quelques mots au sujet de MI4, si ce n'est que pour euh, peut-être démontrer la capacité de, de ce qu'on peut faire à McGill quand on travaille ensemble. Alors, euh, MI4 was created to synergize research in infection and immunity uh, five years ago. And the idea was to stop uh, working in silos and try to bring the community of researchers interested in this field together. We realized that there was a lot of talent, but this talent was quite spread out. And we thought that if we brought together this talent under one uh, community umbrella, and if we encouraged interdisciplinarity, which I'm hearing is a theme tonight, that perhaps the, the, the um, parts would be bigger than the, than the, the sum would be bigger than the parts. So I'm glad to say that we celebrated uh, MI4's fifth birthday uh, two weeks ago in this very room. And uh, I think that we've accomplished quite a lot uh, over the last uh, five years. Going forward, we're uh, very interested in focusing on some of our strengths, and those strengths will include antimicrobial resistance and the microbiome. So for those of you heads up who are interested in, in applying to uh, this prize next year, these will be the themes of interest. So um, one of the things that we're especially proud of doing uh, at MI4 is uh, especially uh, community building and building partnerships. And our partnership with this competition is a great example of that. This is the fifth year that we've uh, contributed prizes uh, to this competition, and it's been an honor for us to do it. And already I am aware that there are some recipients of these awards who have already moved ahead with some of the, the ideas that they pitched here. And I can name one because I think we should all be uh, proud. Uh, Sarah Mashid, uh, in particular, who's herself an engineer, who has started to reach out to virologists and health researchers, and they're really in the process of developing some really interesting point of care diagnostic tests for uh, infectious diseases. And that's exactly what we aim to do uh, at MI4. So uh, again tonight, I'm very happy to say that we will be uh, awarding two uh, additional MI4 uh, innovation prizes. And without further ado, it's my great honor to get to announce the first prize tonight. Uh, so the first prize is act actually the second place winning uh, team for the MI4 um, innovation prize, which goes to Cura Forge. So I would like to invite Sean Seltzer <laughs> to the stage. Great, thank you so much. So this is a picture of, from Wuhan, China, the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. It was a very difficult time for patients and for healthcare workers as well. And if you look at how the healthcare workers are dressed, there's no way that they'd be able to use a stethoscope. And in fact, it was considered dangerous. So as an internal medicine resident just starting out, um, all I had to f against the pandemic was personal protective equipment and a COVID vaccine that people weren't too comfortable with. And I remember being very um, disappointed that I wasn't allowed to auscultate or listen to my patient's lungs. And I thought, what a shame that this stethoscope, this clinical tool, this important tool to listen to my patient's hearts and lungs, heart and lungs, was virtually wiped out of the healthcare system. And I'm here to change that. This is a very nerdy picture of me in a robotics team that my colleagues would be very embarrassed to know that I still have. But basically, that's where I learned some of the digital electronics. And with my hobby of 3D printing, I came up with a low-cost and innovative solution to this problem. So without further ado, I bring you the Oracle. It's a handheld electronic stethoscope adapter that transmits the audio from your stethoscope directly to, electro to, to uh, wireless earphones. And the product, it's fast. It's ready to work in less than 10 seconds. It's also very simple. You don't have to connect to apps. You don't have to connect to your phones. You don't have to bring additional material that can be exposed in infection control settings. Also, it's compatible with all the stethoscopes in the market. 
it's also safe to use. You put electronic earphones on bef with your personal protective equipment before being exposed to potentially contaminated patients. It's also very familiar. It's the same sounds that doctors are used to listening to from their original stethoscopes, just transmitted wirelessly. And lastly, but not least, it's affordable. Each unit costs about less than $20 to produce. So where we are currently, we have a functional prototype, in fact, and we're currently in discussions with McGill's technology transfer department regarding the patentability or which components of the device will be patentable. It will be a class two medical device and will require approving from engineers. And we intend to get this in the clinical setting by the end of the summer so people can try experimenting with them. So in this new era of emerging infectious diseases, let's invest in low cost and innovative medical technologies like the Oracle to protect our precious healthcare workers and to provide our patients with the best and safest care that they deserve. Thank you. Well done, so congratulations. And now for the first prize, uh, uh, MI4 Innovation uh, Prize, the first place, uh, the winning team is Backpen Diagnostics. The team is led by uh, Geraldine Mel, Ed Harvey, and Raphael Trouillon. And I'd like to invite uh, Geraldine to the stage. Good afternoon, my name is Geraldine Mer, and uh, I'm an electrochemist. So I used to work on fuel cell and solar panel, and as soon as I arrived to the hospital, I was obviously surrounded by physicians, and I started talking to them, listening to their problem, and um, I quickly realized that my electrochemistry background could help them solving their problems. So I first worked on scalpel to detect cancer cell, you know, in tumor resection in operating room, and one day I was talking to this clinician about um, how difficult it was to treat prosthetic joint infection, mostly because when you want a definitive diagnostic, it will take a lot of time. And because it is a life-threatening disease, the physician has no choice but to prescribe antibiotics without having the results. So, and furthermore, you cannot monitor the effect of the therapy so there is, a big, there is a high risk of relapse. And I'm not going to go even, you know, to talk about the problem with overuse of antibiotics and antimicrobial resistance. So I offer him my scalpel, with adapted to bacterial detection. So he was not very enthusiastic about that because like, oh, it's a bit invasive, you know, it's not very interesting. And I was watching my hand at that time, and I was like, oh, but what about a pen? And he was like, oh, my work. And here we are, two years later, with the solution to control bacterial infection. So this is the back pen, which allow real-time monitoring. It's a, we develop a very compact design with easy reading to detect not only liquid sample, but also, it's important, solid sample. And this is due to this disposable electrochemical sensing tip. So it works, so basically you have a tip here which is constituted on different type of electrode and each of them is going to be able to detect different type of bacteria. It works like bacteria produce bioactive molecules, so virulent factor, and this virulent factor are going to interact specifically with our nanostructure electrode and produce some electron and that's going to be easily detected and monitored. And this signal is going to happen in less than 15 minutes. It's very accurate, and on top of it, it's, very, it's inexpensive. So since the project started, we have 
worked on the most common bacteria found in prosthetic joint infection. We have designed the prototypes. We're working on, on the patents, clinical trial, and hopefully in 2026, we will begin to be able to bring the device to the markets. And this is only possible because we have an experienced team. So first of all, Dr. Harvey, who is professor in surgery, but is also a successful serial entrepreneur with, that, that started several businesses. Dr. Raphael Trouillon, who is a professor in electrical engineering at Polytechnic, and myself. So the market is huge, okay? There is, oops, sorry. There is a growth rate of 19%, and our biggest competitor is a time-consuming and very archaic bacteria culture. So we know, and they know, that this needs to happen. Thank you for your attention. Merci, Dr. Hudson, et félicitations aux uh, uh, deux équipes, uh, Backpen et Oracle. Um, now, now I'm uh, delighted to introduce uh, uh, Ms. Stephanie Riddle. Um, she is the uh, president and CEO of the Montreal General Hospital Foundation, and she will award the uh, Maria Zelenka Royce Innovation Prize. Ms. Riddle succeeded Jean-Guy Gourdeau as president and CEO of the MGH Foundation on April 1st. In her previous role as Vice President of Development, she worked closely with the hospital leadership in the community to raise funds and awareness for priority healthcare needs. In particular, she oversaw the Code Life campaign, which raised over $110 million for vital care, exceeding the original target. Prior to joining the uh, foundation, Stephanie worked for her alma mater, McGill University, uh, most recently as senior philanthropic advisor. I want to personally thank her for her support of the clinical innovation program and platform at the Montreal General Hospital. We want to thank you uh, for being here today to represent Mrs. Uh, Marika Zelenka Roy and to award this prize, which is offered by Ms. Roy in collaboration with the Montreal General Hospital Foundation. Merci, Dr. Freed. Euh, bon après-midi à tous. Bonsoir, bon après-midi. Sans répéter les remerciements, je voudrais tout juste souligner euh, un, un merci à tous ceux qui ont organisé cette compétition, qui l'ont venu euh, venir, qui ont, qui ont participé à ce qu'on soit ici. Et félicitations à tous les champions euh, qui sont ici aujourd'hui. C'est le bon mot à utiliser. C'est mon grand honneur euh, d'être ici au nom de la Fondation de l'Hôpital général de Montréal euh, pour y participer et euh, pour en faire partie. The MGH Foundation, as Dr. Freed said, uh, has worked in partnership uh, with the Research Institute to launch the clinical innovation platform. It's a very unique in-hospital incubator. In fact, it's, um, it's no broom closet. Tout au contraire. I hope all of you will come visit, but it's an amazing space that houses great people and great ideas. Um, Mrs. Roy, whom I'm pleased to be here representing, is a generous supporter of both our clinical innovation platform and McGill University in this competition, and so it's a wonderful link. Uh, the, she supports uh, these ideas, and the clinical innovation competition does a wonderful job of really fostering the next generation of ideas and innovation uh, for the McGill network. Mrs. Roy, for those of you who don't know her, uh, escaped communist Hungary when she was 18. Uh, in quite a dramatic story and came to Canada where she came to McGill University and uh, took a BSc 
and she was one of the first women to graduate from electrical engineering at McGill. And she then went on to have quite a successful career uh, in that domain. She became an engineer who believed in the power of collaboration between disciplines. She believed in fostering innovation. And her award is really a testament to her own resilience in, in her life, uh, but also gives hope, I think, to, to others. And so she recognizes uh, her spirit and, and then uh, marries that with the spirit of innovation. This is her. Uh, She's an outstanding woman. And so we're very grateful to Mrs. Roy for her support of the prize, uh, for her support of the competition and our platform that allows professionals and students from diverse backgrounds uh, to work together. So I'm actually presenting two prizes uh, this evening. The first is the Marika Zelenka Roy Simnovation Prize. This award recognizes an innovation that improves patient safety and quality or addresses an unmet clinical need through simulation. Um, the winner of the Simnovation Prize was chosen uh, by the judging panel and they'll be awarded $4,500 in money, but also an opportunity to come work at the Clinical Innovation Platform at the Montreal General Hospital. And so it's uh, my honor to present uh, the award, to present uh, le prix au groupe Petit VR. Now I understand that uh, part of the group is here and I invite you to come up, but I think a short video is going to be shown as uh, the founder of your group uh, is not here with us. In 2011, gang wars erupted in Brazil, including my city. In one of these drug battles, a father and a son, they were shot. Both went to the hospital, but guess who had most chances of survival? The father and indeed the babe died on our hands. That day changed my life forever because that day I noticed that we could have done a better job if we were, well, better prepared. And I'm not talking about equipment, I'm talking about performance, I'm talking about if we had better training in pediatric trauma. In fact, we are not alone. After that, I started to do a lot of research to understand better this problem, and our research showed that half a million of children die every year at the hospital, and most of the of these deaths are due to lack of good training, lack of better performance. And it's not a coincidence that pediatric trauma is still the number one cause of death in children in severe parts of the world. After that, we needed to find a solution and some in this audience may say that we have a solution. It can be the simulations lab where you can do repetition under stress, like people do in army, in aviation industry, in sports, and they are right. But simulation labs are not accessible to 95% of the doctors worldwide. So we needed to break down this barrier of the simulation that lab. And here in Canada, Although we have the best pediatric trauma course in the world, they are still restricted to few people. That was when, after a lot of brainstorming discussion, we found that solution is Petit VR. As you can see in this video, Petit VR is a pediatric trauma course in virtual reality. It's immersive. You can do the physical exam of different patients. It's a multiplayer platform. You can test your decision-making, leadership, communication, situation awareness. It offers everything that the simulation lab offers, but also uh, with the benefit that you can play anywhere uh, in the world. So I'm truly happy to be here and to present to you the Petit VR. Unfortunately, I could not be in person as I'm in, in a conference spreading more the word and doing networks for Petit VR, but I'm really grateful that I had the opportunity to tell that baby story. For a people like you, an audience that can make the difference together, we can change this scenario and we can change the world by saving children's life. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Riddle, and congratulations to TVR. And uh, 
We are now at the stage that we're going to move on to our pitch competition and it will be moderated by uh, my colleague and uh, partner in, uh, in this endeavor, Professor Jake Barlett. As he walks up here, let me tell you a little bit about him. Um, he's a material science graduate who specialized in biomaterials during his PhD at the University of London. With expertise in, in tissue engineering, he's developed bone graft and casting materials to create new or improved materials and devices for tissue repair and recovery. In addition to his role as Director of Innovation for the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences and Director of Innovation at the Steinberg Center for Simulation and, and Interactive Learning, Dr. Barlett is also a Professor in the Department of Surgery and Vice Chair of Research. He's Associate Director of the Injury Repair Recovery Program at the RIMUHC. He's Research Director of the Division of Orthopedics and Scientific Director of the Clinical Innovation Platform, or CLIP. Lots of roles, and he does them all amazingly well. Dr. Barlett, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and uh, good, uh, good evening, good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> so um, in this section of the uh, proceedings, we're going to hear from the five finalists who will be competing for uh, three prizes, of which there could be three winners or two winners, because one of the prizes can go to, uh, to, to uh, people that have already been awarded a prize. So we'll, um, the first prize <clears throat> Yep, it's for the, uh, it's the Ray Hakim uh, Family uh, Prize. This is the prize that initiated this uh, competition six years ago. Six years ago is 3% of McGill's 200-year history, so we're starting to, to become part of the establishment. Um, so this is the, you know, the, the leading prize, and it's for the most transformative uh, innovation. The next prize is the Marika Roy uh, Innovation Prize for the, uh, the best solution to a clinical problem. And finally, we have the, uh, the Beskin and Power Prize, which is for the uh, innovation with the, uh, the best commercial uh, value proposition, which includes legal services and cash from Beskin and Power Partners. Thank you. <clears throat> So before we uh, start the competition, you know, it's uh, you can look at money and you can look at resources, you know, it's, but it's about value, it's not about uh, numbers. And so we asked the uh, winners of last year's competition to come back and explain to us, you know, what the, what the winning this uh, prize, uh, the Hakim Family uh, Innovation Prize meant to them. And unfortunately, uh, none of them can be here because uh, Jean Moulet, the, the spine surgeon, is in Japan promoting the product. Philippe is in uh, the United States uh, doing a business deal on the product. And Evan Dementberg is on call um, in Quebec City, and so he can't be here either. But they found the time to uh, give us a short uh, video just to explain what they've done in the past uh, 12 months. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very excited to be speaking today at the Click competition, and I'm sorry I could not be there in person. My name is Evan Diamondberg, and I'm one of the co-founders of Momentum Health. Since we won the Click competition last year under the name C-Spine, Momentum Health has really been able to push forward. And I'd like to thank Dr. Hakeem for the generous support that tied us over until we raised our seed round. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the progress we've made in the past year. In January, we closed the seed round led by the AO Foundation. The AO Foundation is the largest orthopedic organization in the world, and their mission of advancing orthopedic innovation aligns perfectly with the mission of Momentum Health. This past winter, we also achieved Health Canada approval, and we just submitted our application to the FDA. I'm also very excited to announce that our mobile and web applications will be launching this summer for use in Canadian clinics and hospitals. I'd like to wish the best of luck to all the contestants this year, and please do not hesitate to reach out if you have any questions or need any assistance. Thank you very much. So it's uh, so no pressure, no pressure at all to the, uh, the people coming. So it's my uh, great pleasure to uh, invite the first team up. Uh, this is uh, Kapam AI and uh, they'll, be, they'll be represented by Pooja Pachijigar and uh, Pranay Dixit.
So hello everyone, we are CAPM AI and we are here to bring revolution for diagnosing capsule endoscopy. I am Pooja and here with me is Pranay. So what is capsule endoscopy? It is a process in which patient takes the capsule which has video in it and while going through the GI tract, it captures 70,000 images. Those images looks like that. And doctors has to figure out like blood, tumor, ulcer, etc. These are just 70, 70 images, but they have to go through 70,000 of them. And due to that, this process is time consuming and is prone to human error. Every year, 1.1 million capsule endoscopy happens in North America. And even for expert doctors, it takes up to two hours to generate a diagnostic report. Unfortunately, every year, the miss rate is 16%, meaning that there is a problem and there is an anomaly in the images, but doctors couldn't find it. Due to that, 176,000 patients has to bear the consequences, like life-threatening conditions, prolonged sufferings, and sometimes death. We can't quantify the value of human life or suffering, but we, we know that it cost healthcare system $188 million. Pranay will expand on this further. Just remember this number. To summarize, the current solution is time consuming and is prone to miss rates. So we address this gap by providing AI powered solution, which will, uh, which will save more than 95% of doctor's time, means leading to cost saving. At the same time, will increase the diagnostic accuracy to more than 99%, means better patient care. So we leverage on the expertise of our Dr. Say and Dr. Solelis, who are diagnosing capsule endoscopy for more than nine years. And with our AI expertise, we developed minimal viable product. So our product works with almost all capsule endoscopy manufacturer. So what it does it, it takes the images from capsule endoscopy and our AI will analyze those images and will generate the list of anomalies and doctors can review it and will generate the report. And by the way, all of these things in less than five minutes. Now let's take a look at the business side. So the capsule endoscopy market size is $550 million. And now coming back to this $188 million, which we just saw a couple of slides ago, is the dollars wasted based on the 16% miss rate. And this $188 million is the North American market. <clears throat> Let's take a closer look. Every year, 1.1 million capsule endoscopies are performed. <clears throat> and with 100% market coverage and a price point of $170 per procedure, it will be $188 million which is exactly equal to the dollars wasted amount, meaning we are not charging anything extra from the hospitals. And, of, and for the same spending, we are offering them better patient care and efficiency of the procedure. And even if we capture 60% of this market, we'll still have the revenue of $112 million, and with 40%, we'll have $75 million. To enter the market, we'll be signing a non-exclusive agreement with capsule endoscopy manufacturers with 35% revenue sharing, utilizing their sales channel for distribution, and we'll be offering 60 days of free usage to hospitals, followed by pay-per-use model. And these are the capsule endoscopy manufacturers, and Biocam and Capsovision offer some features that are similar to ours, but because they are capsule manufacturers, they are not our direct competitors. And we have built our, pro and we have built our prototype and we are refining it now. And uh, we have started our process patent filing and in Q3 we'll be starting with clinical validation, uh, which will go on until the end of next year. And in Q4 we'll be starting with the uh, regulatory filings. And as a product is, uh, is a diagnostic aid, we'll be going for FDA, class two, five, 10 k approval and health care approval. We have, we, for the upcoming years, we have a plan for data set acquisition, uh, feature enhancement and market strategy. And we have been awarded from Concordia Sina Cody Innovation Fund. And uh, we are here to empower GIs with AI. Thank you.
great. I don't want to influence the judging at all, but maybe uh, you notice that this is an entirely student-based uh, team. Uh, that we have two today, so I'd invite the judges now to uh, to judge and ask some questions. <coughs> Can I ask, uh, how did you come up with $170? Was that to match to the TAM, or was there, there something else behind it? So, yeah, uh, that's what, so, uh, so $170, is, that's, that's exactly the point. Like, we have $188, which, is, which are being wasted. So that is something which we can capture. That is a market which we can capture. And even though it's 170 we still have a lot of margin to play around with this price tag. Even though, even if we go down to um, like $100 per procedure, we still are profitable it will still have 100, or 100 million market. So that is what we were trying to see because the objective is to make sure that we are not charging them anything extra. Just like, uh, and that is how we came up with this part. Great, thank you. And I would like to invite uh, Dr. Afialo, who was previously a, a supervisor in our innovation uh, course, who's now here as a, as a uh, contestant in the competition, uh, representing Course Lighter. I'm trying to think of uh, innovation related jo jokes to fill time. So, hi everyone. <laughs> My name is uh, Dr. Jonathan Afialo. And uh, it's a pleasure to represent Team Course Lyser today. <clears throat> As a cardiologist, I see lots of people every day. They're very different, and I struggle with the fact that our guidelines often recommend the exact same treatments, despite the fact that these are very different patients. They're not different by the fact that they're older or younger. They're not different by what I can find in the electronic chart. My research over the past decade has shown that they're different in very different and hidden ways, we could say. The gentleman in the top left has high coronary artery calcium, it wasn't in the chart. The lady in the middle has high visceral fat mass. Again, couldn't find that anywhere in the chart. And the gentleman in the bottom right has very low muscle mass, despite the eyeball test looking not too bad for any year. The result of this is that patients suffer adverse events. This gentleman had a heart attack, this lady had a bleeding complication from her blood thinner, and this gentleman passed away after his surgery. I think that all three of these events could have been preventable. Preventative treatments, precision dosing, and prehabilitation for this gentleman in the bottom right. Let me tell you how Core Slicer could make that happen. So this gentleman in the bottom right, to use a case example, had a CT scan. Most of our patients before surgery have CT scans, and as a matter of fact, if you come in an emergency room, there's a good chance you're getting a CT scan for something. Course Lacer is a web app where we can ingest CT scans that are done for clinical purposes. Just a regular CT scan, not a special one that we're doing extra for the test. We drag it into the platform, that's the first click, and then we see a number of models which are adapted to the clinical question that we may have. For this patient who we're considering, do we send to the surgery or not, we'd like to know about his body composition. What's his muscle mass? Is he frail? So our second click is going to be on the body composition icon. After that, we have an interactive report within a couple of seconds on the computer using a scan that was already there and measuring information that was just not part of the usual radiology report. This information includes the muscle mass, the fat mass, the bone density, and a lot of other things that you see cascading on the screen. Over the past couple of years, we've had a chance to validate this tool in many different pathologies, transcatheter aortic valve replacement, cardiac surgery, vascular surgery, heart transplantation, even in congenital heart disease. We did a paper in COVID not long ago looking at cardiovascular calcification and most recently extended this to MRI, our second modality. What do we take from all of these studies that we've concluded is that no matter what population we look at, if we find these hidden impairments, these hidden deficits that are especially common in older people, they're two to three times more likely to die. They're more likely to stay in the hospital for a long time, especially in the ICU. 
If they come to the ER, it's going to be a revolving door. They're often going to come back and be readmitted. When they go home, they don't thrive. They kind of clump, and they end up in nursing homes or convalescence or rehabilitation facilities. And finally, they cost the healthcare system a lot of money. We did a cost study and found that, on average, a frail patient with these kind of findings using core slicer would cost the healthcare system $10,000 more in hospital costs. And of all the extreme cost cases that were above $100,000 for this kind of surgery, heart surgery, all seven of those patients in our study were frail according to our markers. And after developing this and looking at it in a few different cardiovascular situations, lo and behold, people started noticing across the world. And we're now up to 90 publications in all kinds of settings by other groups in the world. Gynecology, orthopedics, you name it. Our group has strong expertise in frailty, as I mentioned. We have an excellent dev team. We have one of the strongest databases in the world of, of scans. And not only just scans, because a lot of people have scans. We have deep phenotyping and outcomes. And finally, with over 3,000 users, just word of mouth, in fields that are completely unrelated to what we do, we have good traction. The market analysis, it's a big market at the intersection of uh, imaging, AI, and aging. And we're going to go after hospitals and healthcare networks first. And the pre-op market is our beachhead. We're really preaching the value-based model here, where if we can detect these hidden impairments that nobody else is finding, we can act on them, we can improve outcomes, and we can reduce costs. Our competitors in the AI imaging space are not really in this niche. They're more focused on helping radiologists read quickly and more efficiently. And this is to conclude our roadmap. We uh, started in 2014 with a humble 1.0. And this year has been great. We've partnered with AWS. We were invited to RSNA, and we just got important grants from Amazon and CIHR. And the future is exciting. Thank you. That's great. Um, any questions from the judges? Do you have the microphone? Yeah. Uh, incredible work. Uh, two quick questions for you. Um, how do you think about uh, reimbursement from, uh, from health insurance providers eventually down the road? I, I assume that that's part of the business model. And, and second, uh, in terms of your data processing, is that done on-prem or on the cloud? So thanks, Jeremy. The data processing is done uh, all cloud-based, so everything is in the cloud. And reimbursement is evolving. There was just recently a new code for opportunistic re uh, diagnosis of osteoporosis, so with a new CPT code for that. Our platform does that. And I think it's not long before the same kind of codes appear for sarcopenia and other phenotypes. So we're seeing more and more uh, CPT codes for these opportunistic uh, pickups on scans. Once you define frailty, treatment of frailty, as you probably know, is very difficult. So imposing a restriction or a delay in the surgery might not be a feasible option so tell us what you would comment on this issue. Yeah, this is kind of the bane of my existence, so uh, thank you. It's not, uh, there's no magic pill for aging, there's no magic pill for frailty. It all comes down to things like exercise, rehabilitation, protein supplementation, and just surrounding the patient with, with allied health professionals, geriatricians, and every case is different. So the approach has to be individualized. I think prehab is very promising. It's been shown that prehabbing frail patients uh, saves 8K to the healthcare system, and the intervention itself only costs about three. Um, obviously difficult to scale across millions of patients, but we do have things like nutritionists who are some of the biggest users of our platform. We have Alberta Nutritionist Services who uh, are using this provincially now to help uh, convince their surgeons to protein supplement the patients in the periop. So that's, I think, a win. And then sometimes just calling the geriatrician for extra support who's there in the hospital. And they're the experts at this complexity. So we have different tools that we can use um, to help the patients. But you're right, it's not easy. Ready? Nadine? Tell us a little bit about the patient education piece and like the role of the nurse in um, this device. Yeah, so one of our top collaborators is a nurse in uh, British Columbia who's uh, started Oh, we're going quickly here. Who started uh, rolling this out uh, BC-wide for uh, pre-transcatheter aortic valve replacement? So oftentimes, 
The nurse is that first point of contact, that direct contact, who wants to know the frailty information and convey it to the team. But it's just time consuming to do the physical tests and the questionnaires. Again, that's what the first 10 years of my uh, research career were spent doing. And nobody really wants to do it. So despite the fact that we have hundreds, if not thousands, of studies saying, hey, guys, frailty is important. Look at it. Everyone always shrugs their shoulders and says, well, who's going to measure it? And so, uh, including nurses. And so the benefit here is that it's happening in line. It's happening, happening in real time. And it's happening opportunistically without extra, um, extra time or effort. Corey? These, these opportunistic images are, are, depending on where you're scanning, is it, if it's uh, head and neck or thorax or abdomen, do they predict in the same way? Or is there a lot of variability depending on what type of scan you have? So we have experience with the chest, the abdomen, and the thighs. Um, and again, with multiple modalities. Our platform can ingest CTs, MRIs, or ultrasounds. In the chest, there's good information to be had in the muscle and the fat mass. The abdomen is kind of, I guess, my, my favorite because we have the psoas muscles there, which are very predictive with a lot of, um, a lot of evidence to support that. Uh, the legs, too, thigh muscle mass and quality is, is a very predictive feature. So regardless of what is imaged, even now we're developing algorithms for head CTs and brain CTs. There's some muscles uh, in the head that we've, uh, we've zeroed in on. So there's always something to look at. Uh, regardless of the region. Steve? Um, I, I really enjoyed your clinical um, benefits analysis, and you, know, you live it every day, and it's obvious. Um, I'm just wondering, when it comes to the challenge of showing to the payer system, particularly in the States, the economic benefits of this, have you really given consideration to what kind of clinical modeling or clinical s studies that would be required in order to prove the economics of this. Yeah. I think that the, the bottom-down approach is tough here. The, 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 the top-down approach is a little bit easier. And we've kind of looked at a value-based uh, model to convince the payers that, hey, this makes sense. The, 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 the calculation you see there is that if we have um, 18 million major surgeries in the States, 6 million are uh, older adults, 1 million are going to be frail, we know that no matter how you slice and dice it, frailty costs at least 10K more per patient. And we could probably cut that in half with things like prehab. Even if we can only reach one-tenth of the frail patients with these interventions logistically, the numbers are very high when we present the value. We were looking, averaged over all 6 million older adults, at numbers like four to $800 of value by treating frailty, identifying it, doing something about it. And that's even being conservative. So we're hoping that if we show the value at that level, and clearly pricing is going to be uh, a lot lower than uh, 800 or $400 a scan, that that will be compelling to not only the hospital systems, but potentially the provincial bodies and other people who are paying the bills uh, related to these cases. Great. Thank you. Okay, so uh, next up is the uh, second student team, uh, Med TQ, um, and this will be presented or represented by Ludwig uh, Mute. Take a look at the screen. On your left, we see a belt that was used as a tourniquet during the two world wars to prevent soldiers from dying or losing a limb. A hundred years later, there has been improvements. It looks nicer, right? But actually, only little evolution has occurred. Overall, it's still just a belt, but with mechanical augmentation. And we are still using early 21st century technology when we have made huge advances in this area. And it is crazy that there haven't been more improvements, especially when you look at the statistics behind inefficient tourniquet use. First, incorrect tourniquet use results in 7% deaths. It also results in amputation in 16% of cases, as well as an additional 10% complications. And during the war in Iraq in 2006, in a single year, 114 adverse events occurred, 114. 
By speaking with military surgeons and trauma surgeons, as well as military personnel, we identified two main areas that have to be addressed. First, uh, the duration of tourniquet application, and second, achieving complete vessel occlusion. If the, uh, the tourniquet is applied for too long, that can lead to amputations. And if, and if a vessel occlusion is not properly uh, accomplished, then you cause neurovascular damage, which is another problem. And we hope with our product to reduce these percentages to less than 1% in each category. I am Luke. We are MedTQ, and we're here today to bring tourniquets into the 21st century by presenting our innovation, the Smart TQ. We believe that by monitoring occlusion using vessel occlusion sensors, uh, LEDs, and a wider band, as well as a timer, we will be able to save limbs and lives. Currently, on the market, there are three main competitors, the CAT, the SOFT, and the EMT. Compared to those, we would be the only ones measuring occlusion over time and also still have a competitive price. In terms of market, we would like to sell our product to NATO troops, which consists of 3.5 million soldiers. On average, a year, a soldier uses three tourniquets, and our tourniquet would cost $50 and doing the calculation gives us a serviceable, accessible market of $525 million. But for now, let's focus on our go-to market strategy. We have identified our beachhead market as the response forces and special operations of NATO, US, and Canadian militaries, and they consist of 76,000 soldiers. And using the same calculation as before, it gives us an $11 million market. To achieve this, we would have a marketing strategy where we would use our network of key opinion leaders, as well as military health conferences such as SEMVAR and NHSRC, and we would combine this with a partnership with TACMED for manufacturing and distribution benefits. And with success in each of these categories, we would then be able to expand into a serviceable, accessible market. And remember the 114 adverse events I just mentioned? Well, they cost $61 million to the US government for just, again, a single year. And our product would have saved that. In terms of where we are right now, we have just finished a surgical innovation program, and we're going to continue our research and development for our product to perfect it. We also have begun exploring non-diluted funding opportunities. Also, in the meantime, this summer, we want to start our patent filing as well as trademarking our, uh, our uh, product. And we also, we would like to approve, uh, do our application for FDA and Health Canada. And for FDA, we would be eligible for a 510K class one exemption. In terms of partnership, as I mentioned before, we would like to collaborate with TACMED. And we have already started a little talk. And they are interested in potential collaboration. And also in the future, we would like to do our ethics approvals and start clinical trials. And then once everything occurs if everything works out perfectly, and we achieve success in each of these different paths, we would then be able to go to the market with our final perfected product. Our, we consist, we're a multidisciplinary team consisting of three sub-teams. We have the product development team, we have the medical expertise team, and we have the business management team. And we're in constant contact all the time to make sure our product advances. I would like to thank our key opinion leaders, and finally, I would like to invite you all to save time, save limbs, save lives. Thank you. I would like to invite my teammates, Romy and Gabrielle, on stage with me to answer any of your questions. Thank you very much. Judges. Any questions for the MedTQ? You. You suggested that you don't have a patent yet on this, and my concern is something like that can be easily reproduced by other companies very quickly. So I hope you will focus on patenting that idea. Any thoughts on what, why are you waiting this long? Well, so first of all, we wanted to make sure that our design was complete enough that we knew that we weren't going to be changing major parts of it. We agree with you that patents are very important. We will be pursuing them imminently. Um, but also a big part of our innovation and what makes it unique and harder to copy 
is our vessel occlusion sensor, which we won't go into detail too much, but we, we really put a lot of work into that. So. so the sensor for the vessel occlusion, you're able to block arterial flow, but not venous backflow? Any, uh, we, to the extent that you're comfortable we, talking we, about? We can't go into okay. too much detail, sorry about okay. that. <laughs> that is our little secret. Okay. For now. <laughs> Nadine, were you, uh, you getting ready? I had a question. Hey, can you guys hear me? Oh, there we go. Well, congratulations, students, on the fact that you guys are in school and working on this. I think that's amazing. Um, I'd love to hear from each one of you, like, what excites you about this project? Why, why do you guys want to work on this? Uh, one of the things is that we're currently focusing on the military. However, we do see in the future expanding to civilian settings. And uh, that's one of the things that really motivates our team also. And specifically for myself and for Ludovic, uh, we're two people who find ourselves in positions where it's very possible for us to possibly be drafted to militaries in our own home countries. And when we started looking at tourniquets, and as Ludovic so eloquently presented, you know, all the statistics that show how really deficient they can be, we got very concerned. We said, oh my god, if we go to the military, we need a tourniquet. I don't want to be part of the 16% that loses their limb. I don't want to be part of the 7% who could have had a preventable death. So we really started looking into this and being like, how can we fix this problem? And, and also, uh, even with training, there's a lot of problems still with applying the tourniquet. As uh, before was mentioned in the military, they do a lot of training, but still, there's at least 60% failure when applying the tourniquet in, after, tr after three day trainings. Can you, can you comment on the relative size of the civilian versus military market for this? Yeah, so the military market would be the largest um, I, I think it's to nobody's surprise, but militaries are very secretive with their numbers, so we can't comment specifically on how big um, the market would be specifically. What we can say is that our product is more geared towards the military, but is also potentially applicable to EMTs, because we know that uh, police officers, uh, people who operate ambulances, they are all carrying um, tourniquets, and many of them carry Soft, which is owned by TACMED, the company that we are in talks with. I seem to remember you had uh, some statistics about the Boston bombing and uh, to the consequences of tourniquet, incorrect tourniquet. Could you comment on that? Yes. In the Boston Marathon, uh, where there was a mass shooting, or I, it was a bomb, right? Bomb. Okay, it was a bomb. Um, they had to resort to a lot of improvised tourniquets, which are tourniquets that are made of cloth, where people are grabbing at whatever materials they can to try to fasten it about the limb. And because these tourniquets were improvised, they had a failure rate of approximately 86%, which is extensive, to say the least. Steve? Um, I'm going to ask you a question that you may have already had thrown at you. And if not, you'll probably get it pretty soon. Um, with all these issues about old designs and tourniquets that haven't changed in 100 years, why hasn't somebody done something sooner? That's a question that I always get as an entrepreneur when you come up with something. So why, why did it take so long? What, do you have an answer for that? Well, I think it's very much a process. And though our first slide showed, can we finish the question? Or? Yeah. OK. Though our first slide showed that the basic design of tourniquets stayed the same in the past 100 years, there have been other tourniquets. For example, the Israeli silicone stretch tourniquet was about 8 centimeters wide and just a strip of silicone. And that was used up until 2012. So there were other tourniquets, there were other designs, but we're really focused on addressing the issues that plague the military and people who need tourniquets. Thank you very much.
So now it's my uh, pleasure to welcome on stage PL Signals, uh, who will be represented by Dr. Annie Phillip. Dr. Phillip. Thank you. Thank you. PL Signals uh, is excited to be here and honored to be here. Our journey began 20 years ago when we set out to find a solution to a disease which is responsible for 45% of all deaths worldwide. And this disease is called scarring or uh, fibrosis. You, you see, when an injury occurs, uh, our body heals with a scar. But in many conditions, many disease conditions, uh, the scarring process is uncontrolled, leading to organ failure and uh, loss of function. It's a devastating outcome for millions of people worldwide. Um, fibrosis can occur uh, in the heart after, the, after a heart attack, in the lung uh, if you're exposed to toxins or uh, pollution, in the liver due to alcohol consumption, or uh, in the kidney due to many disease states as shown here. Um, yet very important Fact to, fact to remember now is that no matter what the initiating cause, there is a common mediator that propagates the fibrotic process, and that culprit is, called, is a growth factor called TGF beta. In 2002, in our lab, we discovered uh, the most potent inhibitor of TGF beta in the body, a molecule called CD109. However, CD109 is uh, too big to, to be used therapeutically. We wanted the active domain, active part of it, a little piece of it. So we engineered it, and uh, in, uh, in 2018, with the help of CHR funding, Canadian Funding Agency, and also Department of Defense funding, we, we found it, and uh, we engineered a small molecule called PLSP1, which can block fibrosis in the lung, and also in patients' fibrotic cells. And we hold the US and uh, European patent, Canadian patent is pending. We feel that we are the, we are the world leaders in this specific field, and uh, we, will, we find, uh, we, we were, with uh, about two decades of expertise, we, we realize the true value of our technology and feel a compelling need to take it to the, to bring it to the market for patients' benefit. I will now ask my colleague, uh, she, Dr. Shika Chawla, to present the business plan and the commercialization strategy. Thank you. Thank you. I would start by introducing my team. Uh, our team is headed by Dr. Annie Philip. Uh, myself and Dr. Kenneth Finson, we are responsible for leading the scientific activities and product development. Ms. Jini John is our business coordinator. Dr. Yuri Saragovi, a McGill professor and a successful entrepreneur, is our business advisor. The target population for PLSP1 are the patients with interstitial and idiopathic lung fibrosis, where PLSP1 will be given targeted to the lungs in the form of aerosol formulations, where it will inhibit fibrosis. We have studied, done the market survey, and we have seen that the prevalence for lung fibrosis is increasing, and so is the lung fibrosis market, which is increasing at a gagger of 7%, depicting a vast market potential for our innovation PLSP1. PLSP1 gives us competitive advantage in the market. The most significant competitive advantage, which is also a USP, is its high isoform specificity for TJ beta 1 isoform, which is the main culprit in fibrosis. And it has better target affinity compared to the currently available therapies like perfenadone, nintadenib, and anti TJ beta antibodies, which show no specificity for TJ beta 1 isoform. Moreover, being a peptide, it is smaller in size and thus it is easier to manufacture. Our business model is B2B, where pharma and VCs are our patient market. We would focus on developing formulations using the joint ventures and partnership opportunities. We are open to out licensing partnerships and generate some milestone based revenue. As an alternative, we would like to focus on application of PLSP1 for skin fibrosis, for instance, treatment of burns and aesthetic application, since we have preclinical data of PLSP1 inhibiting skin fibrosis as well. 
now that we have a product the next steps in line are conducting the pharmacodynamic studies and generating the aerosol formulations for testing in animals like mice models followed by safety and toxicity studies at pl signals we strongly believe our innovation is has the potential to revolutionize the treatment for lung fibrosis this motivation is rooted in the fact that this is a product of two decades of research and we are the world leader in this specific area we know the science behind it if we do not do it now it is unlikely anyone else would thank you and well, thank you <clears throat> Yes, you can stay on there. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Have the mic on, please. Congratulations again. Uh, do you do you have any uh, animal model data to be able to demonstrate that you're able to either reverse or slow down the progression of uh, scarring or fibrosis? Yes, we do. And can you speak a bit more to that, oh, perhaps? Maybe there. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, we do. We have. Uh, we uh, we can uh, uh, we can inhibit the development of fibrosis and also reverse uh, the existing fibrosis in the skin. In the lung, we haven't done the second part yet. Question: I, um, I used to work for Varian Medical Systems, they're a radiotherapy company, and yes. there's a treatment of saber. Serotactic yeah. ablation in yeah. uh, radiotherapy. Uh, can this be delivered to these lung cancer patients to prevent the the fibrosis in, like, along with uh, the radiotherapy treatment? Yeah, that is the next model that we would like to test. Uh, we use the bleomycin-induced lung fibrosis model. We would like to now next test it in the radio the radiation therapy-induced fibrotic model. Nice. Yeah. You are proposing to try it in rats by using aerosols. Is the molecular weight small enough that it can go through? Yes, yes, it okay. is. It is a very small amino peptide. And yeah. is there an option for having it as intravenous solution? Yes, that also, like in mice, we, we are going to try that. Yeah, okay. definitely. Uh, there is already technology available for, uh, for aerosol. aerosol delivery of peptides, small peptides. So we plan to use their uh, um, aerosol system so that it's already FDA approved. It's already in the clinic. So we can use that aerosol, uh, their nanoparticle-based system uh, for our peptide too. Uh, moving a, uh, a product like this through to uh, human use is a very expensive and long endeavor. Do you have any plans uh, for your financial needs? Uh, do you have support now? Can you talk to how long a journey that might be and what kind of money you think you might need to do it and how yeah, the expertise yeah. you might have to get it? Yeah, it's an excellent question. Yeah, we were supported by Canadian uh, CHR funding and Department of Defense funding, etc., peer-reviewed funding, uh, and some industry funding, no string attached. But for this, we would require, we estimated to be at least a couple of million, two million dollars, uh, to do the PKPD studies, uh, and also do the, uh, and we have to do a lot of analoging studies to protect the molecule. Uh, although it's protected, we have to uh, protect uh, the analogs as well. Uh, and uh, to do the, the toxicity studies, yeah. Can you comment at all on any additional therapies and clinical developments and what they sort of, how they compare to your therapy, either in terms of safety? Yes, yes. The therapies that, if you can pull out yeah. that, uh, the currently available therapy for lung fibrosis is perfenodone and nintanilib. Perfenodone is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, which is very general. There is no really specific to TGA beta even, leave alone the isoform. Our main advantage is that it targets the beta 1 isoform not the brothers and cousins, not the other isoforms, which have beneficial effects. We don't want to um, you know, block them. For example, TJ beta 2 is cardioprotective, so we don't want to inhibit. So we feel that our technology has the advantage of having that specificity. And I guess what is, what is the clinical concern about not having that specificity? Clinical concern about... Yeah, what is the Adverse side effects, like beta-2 cardiac effects, and beta-3 itself is antifibrotic. 
So we don't want to uh, do something against already a beneficial molecule. So yes. I hope the support of potentially the Quebec government or the federal government that I mentioned earlier is something that you will look into because I think this is a very exciting area. As a nephrologist, I know that fibrosis of the kidney is one yes, of the major yes. causes of yeah. end-stage renal disease. So yes. thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Okay, and last but uh, not least, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Spinort to the uh, stage, represented by Professor Antonia Annett. Thank you. Good afternoon. Antonia Arnard, co-founder of Spinort. In the US, 69 million people have chronic mechanical low back pain due to lumbar and postural strain and that is our target population. The US pays more than $6,000 per year per chronic low back pain patient on usual care treatments. The problem is those treatments do not prevent recurrent low back pain. And why not? When you have chronic low back pain, you don't move. When you don't move, you don't use your deep back muscles. So they are getting weaker, they cannot support the spine, so the risk for recurrent low back pain is high. Spinort is a smart garment with a diagnostic and a treatment component. The garment has embedded sensors that measure the spine posture and the muscle activity. The data is used by the algorithm that identified which muscle is weak, the left, right, and it calculates the near infrared energy that is needed to stimulate those muscles. It calculates the amount, the duration, and the frequency. And the lab results have shown 100% computational accuracy. The dial on the abdominal muscles. So the energy is provided to the abdominal muscles, flow via the pelvic floor into the deep back muscles. We are using the co-contraction principle in order to create strong core muscles and as such enhance the spine posture. And lab results have shown a 60% improvement in muscle activity pre versus post stimulation. Step one to four is one treatment cycle. However, it is a continuous treatment cycle in order to build the muscle mass. Data from each treatment cycle is displayed on an iPhone application. The user can track the information and the physician can remotely follow the clinical data. Spinort is the first non-invasive device. Provisional patent has been submitted and communication will start with McGill in terms of IP licensing and potential assignment. We have three group of competitors. The back the back braces, who provide only back stabilization, the electromuscular stimulators, who only stimulate the superficial muscles, and the last group is the smart posting tracking wearables, who only monitor the spine. Our initial market entry is the 3 million people with chronic low back pain who are seen by US pain specialists who have private employment uh, insurance. The physician will prescribe Spinort and the user will pay $12.99 per device and $50 per month. We have a strong team of key opinion leaders from the US. They are from Louisiana, Harvard, New York, and from the Shepherd Spine Institute. They all agreed about the novelty of Spinort. And I will quote Dr. Shaw, who said, the device, this is the device that you always wanted to develop. I believe in deep back muscle stimulation for treating low back pain. Those four key opinion leaders are key in our business model. And they already agreed to support the clinical trial, to provide us advice in terms of the FDA, the novo application process. Spinort is a class two medical device. They will support us and give us advice in obtaining the new billing code. And at the same time, they will communicate with insurance companies. Where are we in our development? We have a proof of concept. We are doing the alpha testing. We need to develop a prototype. We, are doing the, we need to do the beta testing. And then the next step is developing the garment, which will become our MVP for the clinical trial. What about our timeline? 2023 is focused on the alpha testing of the proof of concept, which is ongoing, developing the, the prototype and the pre-submission to the FDA. We have $100,000 now from the HBHL to secure those activities. 
2024, the beta testing, developing of the MVP, the clinical trial. 2025, we will have FDA and Health Canada approval, and we need to conduct the post-trials. 2026 is the strategic launch of Spinort. And we will start with 20 pain specialists who will prescribe Spinort to 1,000 patients. In the subsequent years, the number of pain specialists and sales will be multiplied by three. But for all those activities, we need funding. We need seed capital, as well as research and business grants in order to develop, as well as test and pre-commercialize Spinort. We are a team with three co-founders, an orthopedic surgeon who has prior business experience, and a spine surgeon who has AI expertise. And myself, I have more than 20 years of digital health experience here at McGill. I would like to say deep back muscle stimulation is the solution for treating low back pain, and that is exactly what Spinort will do. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes. Do you have thoughts on the duration and frequency of usage required to... Stim to stimulate the muscles? No, just actually show an improvement in the outcome for patients. Well, we are doing so. We done the lab testing, yeah? We are seeing now in 60% of improvement regarding the pre and the post stimulation, yeah? But we need to do more testing in order to see the results in terms of the duration and, and the frequency. That's your question, right? Yeah, will patients need to wear this every day? Oh, no, 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 no. So the patient, no, the patient will wear when it's needed, yeah? So for example, they can wear it whenever they want it, when they have pain, but they can wear it for 15 minutes a day. It's as well completely personalized system according to their clinical data. I would, uh, I would just add uh, that it is the duration and frequency that the algorithm will detect and will advise. It is more tailored, personalized, and precised medicine. Exactly. So two quick questions. One is, uh, you, you talk about, in one of the slides, you said 100% accuracy of yes, something yeah. and then a 60% improvement. But I, is that across three people or 300? What's your data set size? No. So the, yeah. the data set now is from, from the people in our lab where we have tested it. And so we have compared the engine with our manual calculations, and that is 100%. And so the, um, the testing pre and post simulation is well with our people in our lab. Okay, and, and the second, it's not a, a large sample. All right. Definitely S not. Second quick one is you, you put up uh, two different revenue uh, numbers. One was uh, for the unit with twelve hundred and some, and then a fifty dollars per month. Is that I, I wasn't clear whether it was one or the other, or there's no, an ongoing service AI whatever. I don't know. That's exactly right. So the patient will pay twelve ninety nine per device on an annual basis. Yeah? And then they will pay $50 subscription per month because they will be followed remotely by the physician. Okay. Thank you. Oh, last quick question. Can I use it just to make my core stronger? <laughs> sure. That's, yes. We are focusing on chronic low back pain patients, but in fact, in the US, 90% of the people have mechanical low back pain. So people in acute phase can as well use it. But we are starting first to chronic low back pain patients. As our data, as our market entry. Have you thought of going after the hyper athletes? <laughs> yes, we thought about it, but in discussion with our with with, with our coach and, and everybody, we thought that the pain specialist right uh, is the first target to go because they have um, they see many different people right and then the next card it can athletes or we thought about truck drivers different other segmentations. But we focus first on the, the patients seen by a pain specialist. And there are 4,800 pain specialists in the US. And they have about uh, 800 specialized pain centers. So we are focused on that first. Thank you any, so much. If there are no further thank questions, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, that was amazing, and I, I'm really glad I'm not a judge because uh, that's a difficult job. <clears throat> so um, I would invite you to uh, take a refreshment in the, uh, the room next door while the judges uh, deliberate. And when you see the, the lights flickering, that's your cue to come back and, uh, and see who, who will be the winner. I want to thank all the teams for their outstanding presentations, their innovative ideas 
and um, the, uh, the judging process was a challenge, as it always is. I would like to introduce the lead judge, uh, Dr. Nadine Afari, who will um, explain the judging process and, um, and how we came to our conclusions. Um, Nadine joins us from California, where she is the manager of research programs at Children's Hospital Orange County and the University of California. She is also a research and development associate with the West Coast Consortium for Technology and Innovation in Pediatrics. She's been a wonderful supporter of the uh, Click competition and has come literally thousands of uh, miles and even more kilometers in order to uh, join us for this. And uh, Nadine, the floor is yours. I am so excited to be here. I've been excited um, for the past month as all the judges, you know, we've been working on these uh, presentations. So as Dr. Freed mentioned, my name is Nadine Afari and I'm one of the managers of research over at University of California, Irvine and Chalk Children's Hospital. I was so excited also to see Petite VR, a pediatric device. Peds and women's health is always underfunded, so it's great to see innovators in that space. Um, so over the past month, the judges, we looked at engineering, prototype, design, but also things like, can this work in hospitals? Can we implement what's the adjacent technology needed in order to do so? We looked at the founding teams as well. So does the team, is it robust? Do you have a data scientist? Do you need a biostatistician? Um, do you have business development experts on your team as well? Because it's one thing to innovate and design these devices, but actually putting it in the hospital and getting it to the patient can be a little bit challenging. Um, in terms of business model development, we looked at the US market, the Canadian market, reimbursement codes, the business model development, can you fundraise? Are you attractive to VC funding? Can you actually get the money to be able to do it? Non-dilutive funding and dilutive funding, philanthropic do um, dollars and federal grants. Again, it's a great start for so many teams, but you know some of these things can be $5 million or, or $10 million as well. And you need the investor to actually write the check. And you need to be accountable for the money as well and be able to, to, to pay it back, whether you're designing you know, to be licensed or you're designing to be um, acquired. Um, and then we again looked at the team. Do you have the right people to move this forward, to you know, get to the next milestone. And I think most importantly, the reason why we do this is to transform patient care. And so we looked at the clinical impact from the patient side, the provider side, the family side, the caregiver side as well, because what we want to do is move the needle. And we think about um, like how much? Is 10% enough for this project? Is 25% enough? Is 50% enough? Or can this really be the new gold standard in healthcare? And I think that's why we're all here, is to really transform healthcare and, and what we want to deliver. Um, in COVID, what I thought was really interesting is we saw such an increase, right, of remote monitoring and telehealth. And of all the 35 applications we saw, there was a lot of companion devices that had apps as well. And so we, we did think about like data discovery and data management. So can your device get the right data to the right patient at the right time when you need to make a, a clinical decision? And can you make a better one with this innovation or device? So I think post COVID, we're really looking at like the data maps of, of these innovation and devices. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Hakeem and uh, Jake for trusting us and the teams as well for trusting us. We did our homework, we do our lit reviews and we talk to each other and our business development folks bring out their calculators and do their math and we look at things like that. So I, I'm really proud of, of how we do this. Um, and I get to be head judge because I follow the most important rule, the Diane rule, stick to the timeline. <laughs> and so that's the reason why I have this. And I'm so honored to be here um, from sunny Southern California, but the weather this week has been wonderful. I should also share with you guys um, why, why McGill? Um, so my dad did his um, work here, graduate work, um, 73 to 78. And my mom was an editor um, with the journals, and so my parents fell in love at McGill. So that's kind of our, my, my love story to McGill. So this is really part about giving back to the university. <laughs> So I'm so happy to, 
to um, give back to the university where I actually wouldn't be here. My parents were immigrants too, and Miguel was so lovely to them and said, yeah, you know, we'll accept you here. So that was really exciting. So thank you guys all for participating. A couple of the teams, we actually had them present to US hospitals. So um, I was excited and I think I probably emailed Diana a hundred times because I was like, they're on, they're on. Um, so that was really exciting. So thank you guys. It's been such a pleasure judging and thank you to the judging um, committee for your service. Thanks. Well, thank you, Nadine. You're terrific. It's, it's, uh, it's just wonderful to hear your story and the story of your connection to McGill. I would like to next invite uh, Carmela DeLuca to present the Bearskin and Par Innovation Award. Ms. DeLuca is a partner at Bear, Bearskin and Par LLP and a member of the firm's executive committee. She's a lawyer called to the bar in Ontario and a registered patent agent in Canada and the United States. She practices in all areas of intellectual property law with a focus on patent matters, including advising clients on strategic global aspects of obtaining and managing patent portfolios and the preparation and procurement of patents and industrial designs. She's been an enormous friend and help to all of us uh, in this process of stimulating clinical innovation at McGill and I welcome you to the podium. Thank you, Dr. Free. That was very kind, as always. And I want to congratulate everybody, uh, the participants, the, the presenters, the judges, the organizers, uh, Jake Barrelet, Dr. Free, Diane, have done such an incredible job. Um, I'm always impressed. I've been involved for a number of years now. Um, and each year it seems to get better and better and more exciting. The, the projects were incredible. Um, I'm here representing Breskin and Parr. Um, uh, Denis Caceres, also at my firm, is a partner with the firm. Uh, we're an intellectual property firm. We uh, specialize in everything intellectual property. We were founded in 1965. So we've been doing this for uh, a long time. And we love what we do. So I've only ever worked at Breskin and Parr because we really like to support entrepreneurs. And we want to make sure that the ecosystem continues to grow. Uh, the clip and the click are excellent examples of how that can be done well. Um, and also, Dr. Hakeem, it's been uh, always a pleasure to see you. And, and this is really great. I have an envelope. I have not looked. So assuming I read the right uh, winner, I would like to, uh, the Breskin and Parr prize uh, is $5,000 uh, in, in cold hard cash uh, to move your innovations forward and also $2,500 in in-kind services where Denis or I or one of the other 80 professionals we have and our professionals span all of the different backgrounds. I'm in life sciences, that's where my focus is. Denis is uh, in AI, that's where his focus is. But we have physicists, we have engineers of every kind uh, and every degree. And my connection to McGill is I did my PhD here, so it has a, a special place in my heart as well. Okay. Okay, enough about that since I know what you are waiting to hear. So the winner of the Breskin and Parr Innovation Prize is Backpen Diagnostic. So <laughs> congratulations. I'd like to invite you up on the stage so that we can take a picture. If they're still here. Well, um, congratulations to Backpen Diagnostics. <laughs> Thank you very much. We will um, Photoshop the picture. It, 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 it'll, be, it'll be nice. Um, the the um, next award will be presented um, by Stephanie Riddle the, from the uh, MGH Foundation on behalf of the um, um, yeah, that's it. This <laughs> is like a uh, award. So, please, Stephanie. Thanks, Jerry. Um, so, I'm very pleased to open the envelope that I also haven't opened, which is the Marika Zelenka Roy Innovation Prize, which we spoke about earlier. And the winner of it is Core Slicer. <laughs> Congratulations, Core Slicer. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Well, congratulations, uh, Core Slicer, and uh, we are now uh, uh, would ask uh, Dr. Ray Hakim to come up and uh, present the Hakim Family Innovation Prize. Thank you very much, and I'm going to try to read it through my mind first. But Ah, PL Signals. <laughs> and I'm so glad because this therapy potentially can impact a lot of diseases, not just lung fibrosis, but kidney disease and so many other things. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I would like to congratulate all of the finalists and all of the winners. Your journey is actually just beginning and we look forward to hearing more and following your successes. In, a, in addition to receiving the cash prizes, the McGill Click winning teams will have the, op, the option to apply for matching funds, which is quite important to leverage external funding. And they will also receive the opportunity to have expert advice and support to nurture the growth of their startup, cur courtesy of our partners. This includes a, des a designated uh, physical presence at the CLIP, the McGill Clinical Innovation Platform, startup program support for our first place winning teams offered by Osler, strategy and product development consultation with Clio, an opportunity to, to participate in an eight week Dobson Health Sciences Lean startup program. I believe that this competition reinforces the importance of teamwork and collaboration to support the creation of new ideas. An idea is one thing, but the opportunity to execute the idea, understanding of the market, the business, and the route to uh, regulatory approval is really, really important. Uh, we look forward to next year and, and hearing a lot of new and exciting ideas. And certainly, if anyone wants to get involved in this process, please feel free to reach out to us. With that, I'd like to uh, close the, uh, the event and just thank everybody for your participation, for your attention, and uh, for all the teams for their submissions. Thank you. Thank you.